welcome back to another episode of Cases from the Past. On this episode, I shall be covering the case of Sally Ann Bowman, an 18-year-old model and hairdresser who was murdered in Croydon, South London. This case from the past all began on the 24th of September, 2005. It is early Saturday evening on the 24th of September, 2005. Sally Ann Bowman, accompanied by her older sister Nicole and some friends, have all made plans for a girls' night out. They plan on meeting up in Croydon, South London, to spend a night out on the town. Sally Ann is in a positive mood, still feeling desires to commemorate her 18th birthday, which was only two weeks previous. At 6.05pm, Sally Ann is picked up from her mum's house by her sister Nicole. Tragically, her final words to her mother were, Love you mum, as she waved and left, unaware that she would never see her mum again. The night moves on. 10pm soon rolls around. Sally Ann spends the evening dancing and socialising in Lloyd's Bar in Croydon. She soon decides to leave, however, and travel to her friend's house nearby. By this time, it is 1am on Sunday the 25th of September 2005. Sally Ann stays at her friend's house for an hour and 30 minutes before requesting a pickup from her boyfriend Lewis. Lewis and Sally Ann have been texting each other all night. The relationship has been distant recently due to each of them suspecting the other of cheating. Typical team relationship drama. Lewis, who had also been out that night with his friends, is hesitant to pick up Sally, but does so anyway. They soon arrive back at Sally Ann's flat in South Croydon. Unfortunately, the pair begin to argue. The words continue for multiple hours as the pair cannot seem to resolve their differences. Lewis, fed up with the situation, decides to return home. Sally Ann exits his car just 10 metres from her flat. It was by now the early morning hours of Sunday the 25th. Within moments of Lewis leaving, Sally Ann is rushed by an attacker wielding a knife. Two screams are heard by nearby neighbours as her body is punctured by the blade seven times. The attacker is aware of the possibility of neighbours having heard the screams and so takes cover behind some bushes. When no activity is evident, he returns to Sally Ann. We can only hope that Sally Ann's ordeal was swift and not completely sufferable, as what comes next is both disgusting and shocking. The attacker rapes Sally Ann Bowman, biting her cheek during the attack. It's not known if she was still alive at this moment, which makes this case even more disgraceful. By the time that people in the neighbourhood awake, Sally Ann's body has been laying lifeless for hours. A neighbour soon discovers the body and alerts police around this time. After the murder, the killer had fled on foot, taking some of Sally Ann's clothing, her bag and phone. These were trophies of his crime. The investigation begins. Lewis is automatically considered a prime suspect based on the arguments and him being the last person in contact with Sally Ann. Despite the police scrutiny, it's clear that Lewis is not responsible. DNA evidence from the scene solidly clears Lewis as a prime suspect. On realising Lewis's innocence, police turn to an attack which occurred just 35 metres from the Bowman murder scene. A woman was hit in the head during a suspected attempted robbery. The attacker ran when a passing taxi foiled the attack. This was roughly 30 minutes before Sally Ann's murder. The situation is made more prioritised when it is revealed that the victim was bitten by the attacker. Progress in the murder case comes from DNA analysis. The attacker's DNA matches to an unsolved sex offence in 2001. A woman making a phone call in a phone box is confronted by a sexual predator. The woman is lucky. The attacker is unable to gain access to the phone box, so he flees the scene. Disturbing still, another six similar style of attacks are thought to be related to the same offender. Despite numerous TV appeals, a 
£40,000 reward and victim e-fit descriptions, no suspect is arrested. The police decided to turn up the heat. Local men in the area are urged to voluntarily take part in the DNA screening procedure. Despite this extreme option, even this fails to bring the killer to justice. An unexpected breakthrough comes to the case on the 15th of June 2006. Mark Dixie, a 35-year-old chef, is hanging out with friends at the pub. They are all watching the 2006 FIFA World Cup when a drink is spilt on Dixie. He responds aggressively, forcing the man outside to fight. This was a major mistake as two police officers observed Dixie assault the man. He is taken to the local police station, processed and a DNA swab is taken. The situation is minor and Dixie is soon released. In just two weeks the case would be resolved. Dixie is arrested at his workplace and taken in for questioning for the murder of Sally Ann. He is calm, seemingly unfazed by the magnitude of the charges against him. The severity of the consequences not impacting him in the slightest. The police revealed that Dixie's heart rate didn't change during the interrogation, it just didn't matter to him. At a search of his home, police discover numerous photos of Sally Ann Bowman. Police surmise that he must have been reliving the crime. Mark Dixie is charged with the murder and given a life sentence. But the investigation into his past doesn't stop there. Sally Ann Bowman clearly hadn't been the first victim for Dixie. The investigation further solidified Dixie as a dangerous sexual predator. His offending history began in 1986 and continued all the way until his apprehension. His crimes include robberies of women, sickening sexual offences and a savage attempted murder of a young woman in Australia, a case which exhibits the same MO as the Sally Ann Bowman murder. Fortunately, Dixie is now off the streets, confined to the cell for the rest of his life. Reports from the prison suggest that he is despised by the prison population. Fears for his own safety are now his main concern. So, what can we learn from this case from the past? Well, it seems like Dixie was only caught as a direct result of his own bad decision making, and it is clear that he shouldn't have been in society to begin with, given his propensity to keep reoffending. Further in support of this is his extensive sexual offence history and violent behaviour that he exhibited. I feel like this could have all been avoided, despite him being deported from Australia for multiple sex crimes, surprisingly, no offences were shared with the UK. The tragic events which unravelled with this case are completely unfortunate. A sexual predator living amongst good, regular people is a sad fact of life. The sad truth of this case is that Mark Dixie was only in the area because he He had lived there years before. He knew it well. Rest in peace to Sally Ann Bowman. I hope her family have gained a level of closure knowing her killer is unable to harm another innocent woman. This has been another episode of Cases from the Past. Thanks for watching.